This is why we practice unconditional, unexceptional, that is, means to say without exception, love and compassion for all sentient beings. This is why we come to learn that we should care for others even beyond our own ordinary concerns. Because if you think about it, if we are all that same nature, that same uncompromised, primordial, precious wisdom, then there are so many more of you than there are me. Asleep and in pain, beyond this room, so many more than there are us. And so we practice the end of suffering, oddly enough, by awakening to the loving concern of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and awakening to caring more for others than for our own awakening. Oddly enough, it is this that alleviates our suffering. Believe me, without exception, when students get in that place, and we do, that weird place where it's just not working anymore, and they come to the teacher and they say, I just, I feel crappy, I'm not working it, I can't feel it, I, I, I just feel lost, I feel that. I don't have my path so solid, I can't see the way. So we come to our teachers and we say that. And you know, without exception, the response that I have to give is that you are too self-absorbed and you have not been concerned for the liberation and salvation of all sentient beings. It is then that we're lost, when we forget the great view of the Mahayana path, that all sentient beings are suffering, and that they are suffering without understanding or awareness as to why. They do not understand the great liberating awareness of the relationship between cause and result. They do not understand if they gather onto their minds and hearts all sorts of silly and non-virtuous concepts and ideas that suffering is soon to follow, right on the heels. And so it's a toss of the dice for most people. And yet they are that precious one. They are that precious nature. asleep. Surely we can see the usefulness of practicing such in such a way as to awaken, as to move into recognition. The more one prays in a heartfelt way to embody the very qualities to perform the very activities to abide spontaneously in the same nature as our own root guru. The more that we pray like that with fervent regard, the more our nature mixes with the nature of the guru like milk with water. That's the saying. But what's really happening? The sun is the same, but we have to spell the clouds. We have moved out from cover. We are finally recognizing the uncontrived, omniscient, imperturbable, 
nature of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, which is like the sun to us. We hunger and thirst for love to the degree that we do really stupid things. We put ourselves in horrible situations, in bad relationships, and we give up everything, even our good qualities. Our hopes, our dreams, our spirits, we give up everything. And the hopes that we're going to get this teensy, tiny, pathetic little crumb of human love. We turn ourselves inside out for something that will never satisfy and never be permanent. We treat ourselves like beggars at a banquet of delicious and nutritious, nourishing food from the God realms, if you will and suck up the crumbs under the table like dogs because there is no recognition. No way to understand that here in the nature of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas is love unconditional, regard that never changes you know how it is. When you're in a human situation, if you do good, someone will have good regard for you. If you don't do so good, someone will have poor regard for you. Judgment ensues. And eventually, because of the fever of that constant up and down, relationships end. That little bit of love that we really sucked it up for, shamed ourselves for, lowered ourselves for was an illusion. It was nothing. It was just another drink at the bar. And yet as we begin to practice the awareness of the nature of the gurus, of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, more and more the clouds clear and we begin to awaken to that which is our own primordial wisdom nature. What causes us to do this self-loathing, these strong habitual tendencies, these crazy activities that we do endlessly, 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 is a lack of understanding. Constantly motivated by the hope that we might be happy. Forgetting what the real goals are, we forget to recenter ourselves, reorientate ourselves, and so we actually kind of sell our souls a little bit every day for just a little happiness, just a little relief, just a little happiness. But again, the more that we do that with no view, the more that we bring the clouds back. And so in the end, unfortunately, we and others like us who have no understanding of cause and result, who have no understanding of the path, constantly create the causes for more suffering. In, in, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our self-absorption, -absor we constantly create the causes for more suffering. Whether it ripens today, tomorrow, the next day, next year, oh, it'll ripen. <clears throat> because the nature of phenomena as it arises is the same as the pure display of enlightened activity in one way that arises from the primordial empty 
state. What arises from the primordial empty state is the very display of luminosity, the pure bodhicitta, uncontrived, unlimited, and spontaneously complete. So because that's true, it is the cornucopia, it is the great absolute nature from which all vibration, if you want to, or luminosity extends. Everything is possible within that nature. It is possible to become confused. It is possible to believe in the separation between self and other, just as it is possible for you to go to sleep every night and have a different dream. Because it's possible, we have a distorted view, two eyes. That's how deep the distortion is. Two eyes, if you can believe that. Two eyes that are connected to two inner psychic channels that teach us that's how we're supposed to see because it's our habit. And these two psychic channels absolutely ensure that you see duality. But when one accomplishes the pure perception and the awareness of the emptiness of phenomena and the awareness of the emptiness of self-nature, then eventually that central channel becomes pure. And one sees, not with fleshy eyes, but one sees differently, as the Buddhas and the Bodhisattva sees, in a pure, uncontrived, and natural way. So, since all things are possible, when any perceived event, which is solid like phenomena is solid, perceived to be, rather, solid like phenomena is perceived to be solid, there is a mechanical fact of nature that you need to know that when there is that kind of perception between self and other, there is attraction and repulsion, there is hope and fear, and all of this happens so quickly and so naturally that we have literally no choice about it until we practice. No choice to the degree that everything you see is duality, eyes, even two nostrils. Why do we need two nostrils? Two ears so that we can make sure we understand whether it's coming from this point out there or that point out there. That's how habitual it is. But what you need to understand is that when that happens, hope and fear, cause and result, the perception of distinction, the perception of ordinary view, cause and result arise interdependently. Cause and result are, in their nature, the same. So if you think there's any way that you can ever do something or think something that will have no result, that is a delusion. Every thought, every perception, whether it be subtle or gross, has result. If you have unhappiness in your mind, you know, in your world, if you were really in, in, had been practicing the discipline of self-honesty, you could trace where it came from. It's possible, even in this lifetime, in one lifetime, to see cause and result. Unfortunately, it's difficult for many of us in some ways in that many of the results that we are enjoying right now have come from previous lifetimes, from previous life experiences. And so it's tricky 
we can't always see the relationship between cause and result. But I can tell you, and I can tell you that the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas will t would tell you the same thing if they were here. <laughs> that all the Lamas that I have ever told, ever spoken to have told us the same thing. This is basically what karma is all about. It is the delusion of separating oneself from others. It is the hope and fear and cause and result that come from that delusion, that are naturally born from that delusion. And the cause and result arise interdependently. They don't arise like this. They arise interdependently. It is our own strange, deluded perception that perceives uh, the space of time between cause and result. That is our own deluded mind because of our habitual um, tendencies and the way that we are used to perceiving. But I promise you, the moment you create a cause, the result is here. So knowing that, it behooves us to work a little harder at this. It behooves us to reduce the inflammation. I like to use that word because when you think of inflammation, you think of something red and hot. And, and puffy, inflamed. And our minds are like that. Our minds run amok because we don't have the habit of discipline and recognition. We let our minds run away and grasp on things all over the place. It's like I even said to one student of mine, Oh, you're not feeling very well. I think that happened uh, because there has been a lot of stirring up. You had a wonderful teaching from His Holiness a little while ago, and now you're having, hopefully, a nice teaching from me. And, you know, it's stirring things up. And I think maybe some obstacles. And so you have to practice really purely right through that. And so, of course, that person would say to me, well, I don't think so. I think the, I caught the same thing as you know who had. All right. <laughs> and at some point you have to go, okay, all right, no problem, be happy. <laughs> but we should listen to our teacher in that way, who can explain to us a deeper and more profound view. We have to allow that our minds are filled with delusion. We don't like that. We don't love that. We think what that means. We think what that means is that we're bad. But that's just your trip. That's just crazy trip. Crazy, stupid, deluded trip. We have to accept that you cannot always trust your perception. You cannot always trust your own mind. You don't always know what's going on. Far from it. In a materialistic society, we are trained to see the most materialistic and gross view. Period. Nobody, other than once we meet our teachers, has ever taught us to understand the most profound and subtle true view, which is the appearance that is our nature. We did not understand that we were born from a lotus, and our mother didn't understand it either. <laughs> and so now you come to rely on this guide who is your teacher. And you meet it halfway by practicing pure view. 
On the simplest level, you've got to assume that your teacher knows more than you. If you can't assume that, there's no hope to practice. Because you have no guide. Because you're trying to force the captain on the boat to be the janitor. And the boat's not going to head in the right direction. So you have to develop a, a, a distrust for samsaric view, samsaric perception, and a confidence, a vajra confidence in the pure intention and qualities and activities of one's teacher. And so, as His Holiness said when he was here, we should strive with all our might to accomplish the aims of our teacher. Why is that? Because our teacher's here to build an empire and we should help? <laughs> or because our teacher wants to go into the restaurant business and what? You know, what, what is it? What does your teacher want to do? Your teacher wants to lead you to happiness. Your teacher wants to lead you to liberation. Your teacher wants to help you learn to see the sky without impediment. To help you learn that you are indistinguishable from stardust. And so when your teacher says, we have to build a temple, it's not because your teacher needs a temple. It's the teacher doesn't need to be here for their own selfish purpose. The teacher is here to benefit sentient beings. So when, when your teacher needs a temple, the temple is for you. It's your temple. You need this temple. When your teacher says that you should practice, and practice in such a way that you commit to making sure that there's always prayer in the world 24 hours a day. We have, for those of you that don't know, a constant prayer vigil, 24 hours a day. How long have we been going? Not here, but 20 years. Nine, 20 years. You match that. <laughs> We've been going for 20 years, unbroken prayers for sentient beings. Wherever you are, wherever you sleep, wherever you lay your head, in this world, someone is praying for you. And that's a good thing. So we come to rely on this view of our teacher. And we follow like little ducks behind their mama duck. I know you want to be independent because it's America. I know you want to be rich because you're a materialist. I know all that stuff. But do you want to be free? Do you want to see the end of suffering? Do you want the doors of liberation to swing open for all sentient beings? If you don't know what, if you don't want that more than you want a TV set, I don't know what to tell you. When we align ourselves with the mind of the teacher by practicing pure awareness, Slowly, slowly, the devotion is the connection. It is the method which is indistinguishable from the very nature itself. So in a sense, the teacher becomes the ground, the devotion becomes the method, and you become the result in your practice. Slowly, slowly, the one's, own one's own mind and the mind of the teacher mix like milk with water. Slowly, our activities are not ordinary samsaric activities that lead to more suffering. But we spend a great deal of time, more and more hopefully, accomplishing the extraordinary and miraculous meritorious activities of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. 
And then because we are concerned with the welfare of sentient beings, and because we are practicing the methodology of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas and practicing the instructions of our teachers, we develop the Vajra qualities of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas. And because the concern for sentient beings is practiced and is awakened to slowly, 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 more and more, our feelings of guilt and neuroses and self-loathing disappear. They are pacified like that great storm, pacified. And instead, we are filled with loving concern, which is love. We should now, and from this time forward, end the habit of having our only goal being somebody love us. Somebody give us approval. Somebody make us okay. Somebody be our friend. Somebody be our lover. Somebody be our somebody something. And instead, from this point forward, adopt the goal of being the love for all sentient beings that you yourself seek. And in this way, you'll have it for the first time. Each sect has its own different style. When His Holiness was here, he's actually a Kagyu Lama. And Kagyus are known for being very um, proper in their dress. You often see them with those lovely high collars and things like that. It's not that Buddhist, not that the Nyingma people ever get, never get dressed up. We do on occasion. But there's just a style, I think. And, and it often depends on how that particular school was started or what some of the ideas were or what some of the goals that the original lamas had to improve things as they taught them. So it's a different style, but really in one way it's just as meaningless as the silly judgment, judgments that we lay on one another. When in fact we are all the Buddha's sons and daughters, all the Buddha's children, and there's no doubt about that. It's one great family with the same goal. Now again, the Gelugs may do it a little more academically. The Nyingmas may do it a little more funky style. And the Kagyus may do it a little more dressed up. I don't know much about the Sakyas, but I think I hear they're fabulous. <laughs> oh, they're quiet. Oh, well, that wouldn't be me, would it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you can tell where I belong. So, whatever the differences are, they may be differences in schools, difference in leadership, difference in style. But all of that is nothing, nothing. Because the bone, the meat, the core of it is that we are Buddha's sons and daughters. That uniformly we have realized that all sentient beings are suffering. And we have made the choice to commit ourselves to ending the suffering of all sentient beings and to being liberated. We all start with the same precepts, really. The idea that this is a precious human rebirth and that only in this kind of rebirth do we have the faculties that allow for us to make progress on the path in the sense of practice. For instance, I have a bunch of dogs. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many. My daughter says I'm a person of extremes, and she's right. I have many dogs. And I have all kinds of animals. And I love my animals, and I love my dogs, and I feel very close to them. But what's really sad is that none of them have any kind of awakening or awareness. None of them realize that they are literally in the seat of the Buddha Dharma. And sometimes you see a bug crawling on the arm of a Lama with that kind of ignorance. 
What a mixed blessing. That must be very strange, huh? But here in this human rebirth, luckily we have all our faculties complete. We have the ability to be able to study Dharma. We can hear it. We can see it or read it. <clears throat> we can come to attend teachings. We have what is necessary. We even have <clears throat> what you don't think you have, kind of like a rich person that lives poor. What you don't realize <clears throat> that you have is the leisure to practice. And that's really hard to understand because most of us are so busy. And being the self-destructive guys we are, if we're not busy, we get busier. But we feel so busy. And so many of us are raising families and then we have a job. And, and you know, when His Holiness came to America, he said, how does it happen here? How can you practice? You know, in Bhutan, uh, certain parts of the family go to the monastery, they take the teachings, they finish Shedra, they go on three-year retreat, boom, they're on the way. But how many people will actually get to do that in America? And that's because here in America we have the delusion that there is no time to practice. We have to go on picnics, we have to do things with our families, we have to do these things. These are all essential things in our determination. But then sometimes when our goals change, when we realize that yes, uh, we are in a physical life and we do have certain responsibilities on that physical life, who is beautiful today? <laughs> we see these, you know, we see this, uh, these responsibilities and because of our conditioning and our habit, we can't break away. And we think that we've got to continue doing our busy, 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 busy. But in other realms of cyclic existence, it's pretty weird. For instance, there are the lower realms of cyclic existence, and some are the hell realms. And in the hell realms, there is so much suffering and discomfort, so much constant suffering and discomfort that there is no opportunity to practice. It's not like with us where we think there is no opportunity to practice. It's that there is no opportunity to practice. The suffering is so intense that the mind cannot break away from the reaction to that suffering in order to conceive of the idea of virtuous activity. So that's how it is. Now, when we compare our inability to practice to that inability to practice, we realize how foolish our ideas are. I mean, clearly it is possible to juggle things around. Clearly it is possible to do without something in order to gain somewhere else. Well, you would do that if, say, you were a competitive athlete. As a competitive athlete, there are things you don't do. You don't eat supper at McDonald's every night. You don't get supersized. You don't uh, lay around on the couch eating bonbons. As a competitive athlete, of course, you make sacrifices. You have a regime. You get up early, and you live a healthful life where it's early to bed and early to rise. And you take in wholesome food. You make use of every opportunity to consume nutrition. And of course you work out. You exercise constantly and take a lot of great pride in that. And it's a sanctified thing to do in here in America. Move over, there's an athlete. I mean, we've just seen the Olympics. We see how it is, what a to do. Well, if the same, same amount of people would make the same am amount of effort and the same amount of choices towards practicing the Buddha Dharma, towards practicing compassion for sentient beings, what a world we would live in. 
Imagine having seasonal competitions and renunciation. Quite, you know, could happen. Well, probably won't, but you know. Imagine having seasonal competitions in compassion. Imagine, imagine having competition in view. Well, you know, if there was a gold medal or a trophy and worldwide recognition for it, more of, more of us would do it. But it isn't that way. And it isn't that way because we're like little fish going upstream <clears throat> back to the source. You know, we're not like other fish that are swimming around trying to get something to eat. We're, we've got a goal in mind. We're trying to get back to the waters of our nature. With the same heroic efforts that salmon do when they go through all the trials and tribulations that they go through, including bears, in order to get back to their spawning ground. It's a little bit like that. You might look at goldfish and say, hey, that, they've got an easy life. Then you look at the salmon and you say, yeah, I don't think that's so cool. But the goal is different. And so for us, Sure, along the path there are bears, and there are ways that seem blocked, all sorts of obstacles. The obstacles that all of us deal with every day, but don't recognize. We just think they're the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. <clears throat> but on the path, we do meet with obstacles. And yet, unlike salmon, we aren't fish, really. We can apply the antidote. And the great thing about Lord Buddha and his teachings, and the great thing about Guru Pache bringing us the Vajrayana path, so appropriate for this day and time, is that he teaches us that even when there are obstacles, there are remedies that to understand that each and everything that happens to you that keeps you from practicing sincerely and deeply, whether it's anything from your own habitual tendency of being in your head and asking questions and blah, 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 or whether it be the, the habitual tendency of what we call sloth, where we're kind of lazy and just can't seem to get to it, or we think, Let's see, watch TV, do some practice. Watch TV, do some practice, watch TV. Too. I think I'll watch TV. <laughs> and so we think like that. And so those kinds of things, many times we blame ourselves and think this is a choice. Well, sure, in one way it is a choice, but it's an obstacle. And from this point on, when you really enter, enter strongly and in a persevering way onto the path, everything that you see is either an obstacle that you have the technology to overcome, or it is a blessing from the three precious jewels. And that's how you train your mind. Say, for instance, you put on your robes today and you think, oh, things are looking good. I've got my robes on. And then you walk outside and you break a leg. You might think to yourself, oh, now that's just normal, isn't it? Oh, that's just typical. I go ahead and try to do something nice. And I've heard people say this. The more good I do, the bad things happen to me. <laughs> So supposing you go outside and you break a leg. Now you can look at this a number of different ways. You can say, oh, poor me as usual. You can say, maybe I wasn't supposed to take the robes like a neurotic freak. <laughs> I mean, 
maybe I wasn't supposed to, because that guy up there with the X's and checks just broke my leg. So we have these ideas. But there's another way to consider it. If you were to walk out of here and break your leg, Buddha forbid, but if it happened, there's two ways to look at it. Either this is an obstacle that I now have the technology and protection that I now have the auspicious connection in order to get around. So you recognize it in that way as an obstacle. And you say, well, you know, it's like walking through a room full, crowded with furniture and stuff, but the lights are off. You turn on the light and you walk around the obstacles. You climb over them, walk around them, move them, whatever you have to do. And the light, of course, is the guidance of the three precious jewels and our practice of Dharma. Another way to look at it is to say, and this is even better, this is even better. So you walk out of here with your new robes on and everything seems auspicious and then you break your leg. And really, if you had the experience and the view of Dharma and have had it for some time, you might say, this is Gurubhiche's blessing. Because now I'm going to sit down and I'm going to practice. Because I don't have a choice. <laughs> and we come to understand that Gurubhiche's blessing happens sometimes that way. But it's all according to our devotion and our view. We can make that broken leg a big problem. Gurumpache can't do that. Lord Buddha himself can't do that. But you can. You have that power. You can go into some neurotic, crazy insanity and say, Oh, I've broken my leg. That must be a sign from somebody. And therefore, maybe I shouldn't wear these robes. Maybe everything is not so good as I think. And you can start running around in your head like a bee in a jar, as we described, with no view, with no understanding. The way an infant crawls through the world, thinking everything is some, you know, whatever it is. Or you can understand that this is Guru Pache's blessing. Nobody aspires to break their leg. But whatever happens, with the proper view and the proper connection, turns out to be the most auspicious and phenomenal blessing that any of us could have imagined. For instance, I'll tell you a personal story. I had a big bad operation once, a few years ago. Big and bad because it, um, it's a big operation where it's like three inch, two or three inches above your waist and it goes all the way down to the pubic bone. <laughs> <laughs> sort of opened up like a pocketbook and then stapled back up again. And I remember being barely conscious afterwards and the, and the pain was amazing. I remember thinking in wonder. I didn't even know you could feel pain like that. This is amazing. But then I realized that there was a tube entering into the bottom of my body. There's a tube entering into the nose, into the center of my body. And there's a lot of medicine going in my arm. And without, and without any of that stuff, I would die. If you don't think that's practice, because all I could manage at that moment was breath. And my breath was held by Guru Rinpoche. He was there in my breath. He was inseparable from my mind. He was my mind. I called out to him with every fiber of my being. Whatever part of me was not drugged was calling to the guru and having confidence in the guru. And to Guru Rinpoche, I thought, you are my breath. There is nothing but the guru. Here I am in that same position that all beings 
end up in, hanging by that string. Lama can know. But my faith at that moment became so strong. I mean, I have pretty de decent faith most of the time. But man, until you're in a situation like that, you have no idea what a blessing it can be. What a blessing it can be to know that without my breath being supported, my mind being supported, without my correction to Guru and Pache, we are going down. And all I had at that point also were my aspirations. <clears throat> it's not that I'm afraid of death. It's not that I'm afraid of Guru Rinpoche because I've practiced for many years now. And I've practiced for many lifetimes now. So I'm not afraid, really. But I thought about you. And I thought, who would guide you? Who would care for you? Who would understand your Western funkiness? <laughs> Who would understand your ways? What would you do? Would all my work scatter to the four directions? And those who have the karma to be with Guru Rinpoche, would they be left comfortless? And something inside me just grit my teeth and kept on breathing. And it was like that. I will get through this. With Guru Rinpoche's help, I will get through this. <clears throat> and then the most amazing thing of all happened after that. I was so helpless after this surgery that I couldn't dress myself. I couldn't change my own bandages. I couldn't even see my own bandages. <laughs> Couldn't bend that far. Couldn't be comfortable, couldn't be without pain, couldn't be, couldn't live as I normally live for a little while. Couldn't teach my students. But most of all, well, this is kind of gross, but I kept throwing up. And somebody would have to help me to the bathroom. Sometimes I'd make it, sometimes I wouldn't. And then they'd have to clean up after me. Me, who want to clean up after them. And tenderly and carefully, I was given soup, more and more nourishing food, everything prepared so carefully. My beautiful Anis and my family, they would they would care for me the way a mother cares for her own infant child. Because of my stomach being so inflamed, I would wake up three, four times in the night in a terrible sweat, and all my bedding would have to be changed. It was so awful. But for every one of them, I thought, I, I'm so grateful. And I remember just thinking with total humility, what would I do? I would be lost without you. I would never get through this without the care and love that I was shown. And it's, for me, life has never been the same thing. That surgery was like my guru. It taught me of the Vajra love that we share. It taught me that the Lama is the Sangha and the Sangha is the Lama. It taught me of the miraculous virtue of even simple sentient beings, their kindness. I was just shown such utter kindness that several times a day, I would just weep. I couldn't stop crying. I think my family and my aunties used to go, oh, there she goes again. <laughs> I would cry all the time, and just 
beg them to accept my thanks, like if I could have lowered myself to the floor and said, thank you, you're like Guru Rinpoche to me. I see Guru Rinpoche's compassion in your caring for me. How is it that I'm such a big shot in this Buddhist tradition and yet this, these simple people, my family and my anis, my nuns, they showed me Guru Rinpoche. They showed me, even in their simple craziness, because we're all sentient beings, what Guru Rinpoche himself would have done for me if he had been here in the physical. And so from my view, he was here. Guru Rinpoche came to care for me. He was my breath. He was my hope. He was my aspiration. He was my family. He was my attendance. And surrounded by love, I'm all better. How amazing. But if there was an ounce of pride in me ever in my life, I have to tell you, it is gone. If there was an ounce of feeling like I'm something, if ever that feeling arose in my mind, I'll tell you now, it is gone through the kindness and graciousness of my aunties and my family. It is gone. Because I was sick and they cared for me. Because I was laying down and they raised me up. With their love and their devotion, they raised me up. And this is the most profound lesson of my life. So far, this has been the most profound lesson of my life. I know what you're capable of. I know what you can do. I know the graciousness and kindness that is your nature. And I know with discipline and practice, every day, in some way, the scales will tip. The self-absorption becomes less and less, and the weight of your kindness brings about liberation, brings about the giving rise to the pure bodhicitta. No.